Good morning. My name is Ryan White. I'm the Senior Director of Morrison Planetarium and Science Visualization at the California Academy of Sciences. And I want to thank you for joining us uh, during this morning's live stream. Before we begin, I just want to acknowledge the unusual circumstances under which we are currently operating in the United States and around the world. For those of you watching the recorded version of this, uh, you should realize that we are recording it live in uh, early June 2020, while protests and demonstrations are occurring globally, calling attention to grave injustices that have endured for, for far too long. I want to acknowledge the privilege that we have in, in being able to spend a half an hour talking about such seemingly esoteric subjects as messaging extraterrestrial civilizations. That said, perhaps these conversations can provide respite and reframing of some of the challenges that we face as a society at large. So with that, I would like to introduce Doug Vakoch, president of METI, an organization dedicated to messaging extraterrestrial intelligence. Thank you for joining us, Doug. Thanks for inviting me, Ryan. And uh, what we're going to do is uh, what we try to do every Friday, which is to have a bit of a conversation around a compelling topic in astronomy. And in this case, as I've already said, it's about uh, how we can message extraterrestrial intelligence. Um, but we're going to do this in combination with some computer graphics, basically uh, some of the uh, three dimensional assets that we've built up in our digital model of the universe. Uh, so we'll be starting at Earth and uh, traveling through uh, a virtual model of the universe, things that we can't do in the real universe, which means that we uh, which has implications for the topic that we're going to be discussing today. Uh, but I think we're going to start with actually a little bit of history on how people have thought about communicating uh, with life out in the universe around us. So, uh, so maybe that would be a good starting point, Doug. Sure. Yes, Ryan. I mean, humans have been thinking about the possibility of life beyond Earth for millennia, uh, but usually it's been speculation, philosophical or theological ideas. There should be life. There, there probably isn't or isn't life. But really, it was only in the last couple of centuries that scientists began thinking about how practically could we find out if there's life beyond Earth? Uh, and if there is life, how do we communicate with it? Uh, some of the most interesting discussions that we'll see reverberate in terms of uh, the way we're looking for life today began uh, almost 200 years ago, so in the early 19th century. Uh, no uh, less prominent of a mathematician than uh, Carl Friedrich Gauss suggested that we could communicate with extraterrestrials who might live on the moon. Uh, in the early uh, 19th century, that was considered a plausible planetary body that could be inhabited by intelligent life. And the particular scheme that uh, Gauss suggested is to go to the forests of Siberia, uh, full of trees, cut down huge swaths of those trees, um, plant fields of wheat in geometrical shapes uh, that would explain the Pythagorean theorem. So with a right triangle, you take the length of one side, square it, add uh, the length of another side, square it, and it's the same as the volume of the hypotenuse. Uh, so A squared plus B squared equals C squared. And the idea was that if there are technically savvy extraterrestrials who are looking at Earth, they could know that there are mathematicians down here on Earth as well. And maybe math becomes a universal language. And so that's the approach that Gauss suggested um, if the lit side of the Earth is facing the moon. Remember, the Earth is rotating relative to the moon. Uh, and so that works well when everything is visible because sunlight is hitting the surface of the moon. But there was a similar idea not long later of how we could communicate when the dark side of the Earth is facing the moon. And that came from an Austrian uh, physicist uh, called uh, Joseph von Littrow. And von Littrow said, why not go to the Sahara Desert, uh, carve a huge canal, tens of miles uh, in diameter, uh, and fill it with kerosene, 
And when you light it uh, at night, it would show the extraterrestrials that we have an appreciation of the importance of the circle. Uh, now, as we're looking at this visualization now, it's with modern day lights imposed. Uh, so we're really quite visible uh, in the night, uh, even without this additional signaling. But nearly 200 years ago, it was really quite dark. And so that circle just west of the Nile uh, River would stand out to the extraterrestrials. You wouldn't even need to have a telescope that the moon is close enough that you could send a picture in, in, in a very direct manner. You just inscribe it on the face of the earth in some manner. So it's kind so, of interesting that, that both of these had this idea of sort of mathematics as kind of this common language. Well, and I think you see that I think part of it is a bias of the people who are involved in trying to communicate, physicists, astronomers. And so we see that bias in modern day uh, notions of what should we send to the extraterrestrials. I mean, we want to start with something that uh, is, is reasonable, and particularly the further away we get, the greater the technology you need to see it. Um, so the idea is if you can build a technology like a radio receiver to get our radio signals, you probably know something as fundamental as two plus two equals four. But the, the earliest proposals then were to communicating with the moon. But as the decades passed in the 19th century, it became clear that the moon just doesn't have a significant atmosphere. So it's not a habitable uh, body for life to be on. And so there was a shift to communicating with any beings who might live on Mars. Uh, remember, there was a, a, a lot of speculation that what seemed like canals on the face of Mars that you can see through a telescope might actually have been for conveying water from one part of the planet to the other. So the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, there's a, a lot of uh, excitement that maybe Mars could be inhabited. And so if there is, how do we communicate with it? The sad news is, even though Mars is within our own solar system, it's far enough away that you can't inscribe something on the surface of the Earth and realistically think that Martians would see it. So you have to send something that is encoded. And uh, there is a, a French polymath named Charles Crow who suggested using huge mirrors that would reflect sunlight so that you could actually send a, a series of pulses that would stand out as something that's distinctly artificial uh, that the Martians might understand. And so he suggested simply pulsing, and that's going to stand out. And, and one of the things that you wanna say is, well, so this pulse is so not something they've seen from Earth before. That may be a signal that we're technological, but can you go beyond that to say something of content? Can, can, can you use something like flashes of light to draw a picture? And Crow suggested that you do. So let's take a look at some of those pulses uh, that Ryan is showing us right now and just see that there are a series of pulses. There's a bit of a pause and then one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two. So two, seven, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, a bit of a pause. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. One, two, three, four. So it seems like what he suggested is send a string of pulses. And over time, we hope that the aliens would see, well, they're separated by time. But these strings of three numbers always add up to 11. And so his suggestion was we use that to make a map. So those are those numbers on the left-hand side. 11, 515, 434. And so over on the right hand side, you see those numbers are shown as little circles, either uh, white circles or black circles. And so simply by sending pulses of numbers, if you can get the extraterrestrial to make this assumption that, oh, well, they've sent 11 strings of 11 num numbers that total 11. That's an 11 by 11 square. Uh, and, and then uh, the other method, the other way to do this is not just a series of pulses, uh, but pulses of different durations. So kind of like a, a Morse code, dots so and dashes. Almost like, 
like pixels in a very low resolution. Picture. Absolutely. So this is this is the you know how the old television works. If it's a pixel, uh, and this now becomes a, a way of communicating. The, the interesting thing about these proposals is there's been a, a reinvention of some of these ideas. You know, uh, modern day astronomers aren't familiar with uh, the, these early schemes. It's only as we've looked at the history. But we see a repetition. We'll see that as we think about more contemporary schemes for how to communicate with the extraterrestrials. So, and actually, out of curiosity, so was Kroos the first person to propose? Because eleven is a prime number. So, uh, you know, yes, yeah, he, 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 the, the prime number is what we'll see um, in some of the other messages. He didn't actually suggest that particular number, but the beauty of the prime number. So, say we do send that one hundred twenty-one pulses, you can say, hmm, might might that be represented in some other way. Well, oh, that's 11 times 11 is 121. And there's no there, there's no other pair of numbers that you can break 121 down into but 11 by 11. So that becomes a clue to the square format. That was used in a message we'll see in a couple of minutes that was transmitted by radio. Right. So uh, it's nice to think that we could communicate with Martians. But again, um, the, the, the history of the search for life beyond Earth is we got to keep looking for new places to find life. You know, we're not going to find intelligent life on Mars. And so as the 20th century passed, we started thinking of ways we could communicate not with intelligence within our own solar system, but around other stars. And maybe the most prominent uh, messages we sent were on a couple of spacecraft that NASA launched in 1977 uh, called the Voyager spacecraft. Now, the, the Voyager spacecraft, their primary mission was to explore our solar system. There were two of them launched within a few weeks of one another. Voyager 1 uh, went uh, past Jupiter and Saturn and was gathering a lot of data and photographs. The other one, Voyager 2, in addition to Jupiter and Saturn, went past Uranus and Neptune. Um, but they, they are traveling... Uh, you know, Voyager 1 is traveling 42,000 miles an hour, uh, and they're traveling very rapidly by our time scale. Um, and as they finish their scientific mission in our solar system, they just endlessly travel through interstellar space. So on the off chance that an extraterrestrial kind of chugging along through the depths of space happens to come across one, they include a message. The Voyager had a, a message in uh, the form of a golden record. So this was using an adaptation of 1970s recording technology, just a long play album, long play record. Uh, and it is included in this metal case. So it's going to be traveling through space. There may be some interstellar dust. There's a protective shield on it. Uh, and then within that covering is a recording that has etched in the grooves of the record information. Uh, and, you know, if you're going to send a, a record, send a record player, right? So there was actually a stylus, the, the needle that is put on it. And you can see uh, in the upper left-hand corner an indication of how to, from the top view, put that stylus on top and then rotate at a certain speed. And you, you can see this right below. There's a side view of the same thing. Uh, so you, you see the, the, the um, disc, and then there's the stylus. And it's, it's given an explanation of how rapidly to turn it. But, I mean, what? It's not, um, it's not seconds. It's not minutes. What unit do you use? If you go to the lower right-hand corner, you see this diagram of hydrogen, the most abundant element in the universe. And it, as it makes a transition from one state to another state, it does that with a certain frequency that becomes our unit of time um, to tell the extraterrestrial how rapidly to play this. But if we move just to the left, the lower left-hand corner, we see this kind of spidery looking diagram that's actually an explanation of where we are in the um, galaxy relative to some prominent pulsars. So uh, as we uh, think about how to communicate with an extraterrestrial. 
The challenge is always how to give them something. They're not going to understand any of our languages like English or Swahili or Mandarin. What language do we use to communicate with them? And how do we even point to something that uh, is as tangible as a spacecraft? Well, that recording actually includes hints about the spacecraft itself, but it also gives some information that any astronomers who are looking for our signal from another star should be familiar with, and that's our Milky Way galaxy itself. And so that image, that kind of spidery image, actually shows the location of the Earth in comparison to 14 prominent pulsars. Now, pulsars are these uh, very dense stars that rotate and they have uh, an electromagnetic field it get, and each of them gives off radio signals at a specific frequency. So that's something that we have learned by our explorations of the solar system. Uh, and the, the Voyager recording it uses that knowledge to communicate to the extraterrestrials where this message originated. I mean, the, they'll get a ballpark sense from the trajectory of the spacecraft. So basically, so I put up the locations of the of these pulsars that, here. Yeah, yeah. And I think what's interesting about pulsars is they have they 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 have very constant timing. So you can basically it's almost like a phone number for each one of these that you can give the pulsar timing it and identifies uh, the pulsars. It, it, exactly, they are incredibly reliable, and yet over long time scales, hundreds and thousands of years, they change slightly. And so the beauty of this message is it's actually telling them both where and when this message originated, because they should be able to go back and, and look at this uh, three-dimensional configuration and see, oh, this was back to about 1977, and that's when they were launched. Very cool. Yeah. And, and so the, the, the beauty of this is that we're actually making a direct link between something that the extraterrestrials can hold in their hands or tentacles or whatever they use. Um, so the message we're sending them and the physical universe that we and they have in common. Um, so that's the beauty of uh, sending a message by spacecraft. The huge drawback is that it takes such an incredibly long time to travel between the stars with a spacecraft. And, and I mean, we can, we can get a sense of it even if we think about how long it has taken the Voyager 1 and the Voyager 2 uh, spacecraft to travel outside of our solar system. Uh, so both of them were launched in 1977, and it was just a couple of years ago that Voyager 2 finally left, it passed through the boundary of our solar system. Uh, you know, as we're zooming in here, the, the, the outermost circle is Neptune. Uh, that's something that uh, was passed by the Voyager um, two spacecraft back in the 1980s, and uh, you know it took over 40 years to leave our solar system. So it's going to be about 70,000 years before any of these two Voyager spacecraft or two Pioneer spacecraft. Those are the other two lines on this diagram. Yeah, I put the, the Pioneer up in blue, and the Voyagers are in red, and we're showing them extrapolated out to to where uh, they are today based on their. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so you know, it's, it's a nice symbol, but if we're really serious about making contact, we need a method that is cheaper and faster. And so for that, we communicate by radio signals that can travel at the speed of light. Uh, and the most famous message that was transmitted was sent in 1974 from the world's largest radio telescope uh, in Arecibo, Puerto Rico. So 1974, um, it, it was a celebration. It was uh, mid-November and astronomers from the radio astronomy community were gathering to celebrate a major upgrade of this radio telescope. Um, it's a telescope that was originally launched in, uh, in the early 1960s, but now it was being refurbished. It was much more sensitive. And so as a symbol of our capacity as a civilization to reach out to other worlds, they transmitted a, a brief message. It lasted only three minutes. 
And yet when you look at the range of topics, it was ambitiously encyclopedic in scope. So this, the, the Arecibo transmitter is uh, carved into the side of the earth. Its location was chosen because there are natural formations that would, would support this huge telescope, a fifth of a mile in diameter. Uh, and on this day of this commemoration, uh, they transmitted a signal. And the big question is, where did we transmit it? Because the telescope is fixed in the earth, there's a limited ability to point. You can point straight above and about 10 degrees to either side. And one of the prominent targets that was visible uh, was a, a cluster of stars called M13. And here is the message that was transmitted. It was a series of pulses, very much like the uh, idea of Crow's method of sending a series of pulses that could be re reconstructed uh, in 73 rows 23 characters across. And so that's what we're, uh, this is the reconstruction uh, when the extraterrestrial figures out, ah, these are two prime numbers that uh, you were talking about, Ryan. 23 can't be divided by any other numbers, but you know, 23 and, and one, same with 73. So that limits the ways you can reconstruct this. And so if the extraterrestrials put it together correctly, the first thing they'll see, the first part of the transmission is simply an explanation of how to count. Now, there's no reason to think they're going to use a base 10 system, you know, Arabic numerals. So this in, encodes the numbers from one to 10 in the most basic number system that uses only ones and zeros, a binary number system. So it starts with the numbers from one to 10. And then we use that basic ability to count to start talking about the physical universe that we and the extraterrestrials share with one another. So what's more fundamental than what uh, the things are made of? And particularly, we wanted to describe our human biochemistry. So we sent a series of numbers, one, six, seven, eight, 15. That's what this next section is. And you know the, those numbers, the hope is, um, as the rest of the message follows, the extraterrestrials might say, huh, you know, these are the atomic numbers of chemical elements that can be combined to form complex life. So those, those are the atomic numbers of hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and phosphorus. And then the next part of the message shows how many of each of those uh, atoms of each of those chemical elements are found in the base pairs of uh, DNA. So the nucleotides of DNA are shown first in a, a numerical description, and then secondly, in a, in a diagrammatic uh, image showing the double helix, and then in the middle, showing how many of these base pairs are present. So it gives some complexity. That number in the, in the middle is a little over 4 billion. It was a little bit high as an estimate, but that was the best estimate back in 1974. Then we show what to we humans is perhaps the most important part of the picture, us. Uh, so humans have often played a pretty prominent role, even on the Voyage recording. It wasn't on the outer plaque, but there were over 100 images, a lot of them with people in it. But we also want to describe not just what we look like, but something about um, our size. So for example, uh, we show the height. So there's a little bracket and then in, in the middle of that bracket, there's a number and it's 14. Well, we're 14 and the hope is they'll think this is our height, but 14 what? Again, it's not gonna be feet or inches, but it's 14 times the wavelength that was being sent, which is just a little under five inches. Uh, so 12.6 centimeters. So, you know, five inches times 14, little under five inches, it's five foot nine. That's the height of the human being. But we also wanted to explain how many of us are there. And so on the other side of the human is the population of the Earth. And this is the part of the message that would have been the biggest change if we would send it out again. Population of Earth, 4.2 billion back in 74. It's over 7 billion now. Then underneath the human being is a diagram uh, of our solar system. Uh, this is where we come from, the, the sun on the left-hand side. And then the third planet out from the sun, the Earth, 
is slightly moved up toward the human being to suggest that's where we come from. Again, there's a, there's a bit of a historical artifact here. If this were sent today, Pluto would have been demoted, so we wouldn't have Pluto in our solar system. So there are some conventions even in science itself. Uh, and then uh, underneath the diagram of the solar system is a diagram of that dish of the telescope and its size. And then the message is repeated a couple of times. So the, the message on the second iteration and beyond comes out of the telescope itself. So this is a great way in three minutes to include a lot of information. You know, I think uh, realistically, we have to say, this is asking the extraterrestrials to make a lot of leaps. I mean, will they really go from the numbers 167, 815 to, oh, they're talking about chemistry. I, I mean, the good news is um, if you're doing more than a symbolic uh, demonstration that we have the capacity, you have more time to say something more in depth. And, and so as we think about uh, what we what we would do today, you know, the, the big downside of that uh, Arecibo message is the target M13 that I mentioned, straight overhead, prominent cluster of stars, but it's 25,000 light years from Earth. That means any message is going to take 25,000 years to get there and 25,000 to get back. Surely we can do better than that. Um, the, the organization that I lead, Medi International, uh, transmitted a message recently uh, to a nearby star. And so our strategy is to pick uh, the stars nearest to Earth, and we prioritize for that transmission lightning star. Uh, it's a star, it goes under another name, TJ273. Uh, and we know it has a super Earth, a, a, a terrestrial rocky planet like Earth, a little bit bigger, but it's within the habitable zone of its parent uh, star. Uh, I think about the habitable zone to our. Yeah, yeah. And this, this, this the habitable zone, you know, you know the story of Goldilocks, right, Ryan? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and so that that's what we're looking for uh, is a Goldilocks zone, where just like Goldilocks, uh, she wanted something that was not too hot, you know, not too close to the star, not too cold, not so far away that the water would be frozen, but something that's just right. Uh, and so that's what we targeted. In this one, there are different ways of thinking about the habitable zone. Uh, in this one, uh, GJ273, uh, B is a little bit outside of it, um, and this is uh, an artist's uh, rendition of what that looks like. And so the, the it is uh, both sobering um, as we look at the history of attempts to make contact, uh, because so far we haven't found any. You know, the the actual search, not just sending messages, but listening for the kind of signals that we're sending out as demonstrations has been going on for over half a century. We haven't yet found anything. Uh, and so in, in ways that can be sobering that we haven't yet detected extraterrestrials. On the other hand, the universe is a very big place. We've looked at only a fraction, you know, tens of thousands of stars closely out of the 400 billion in our galaxy alone, billions of galaxies in the universe. And the big uh, thing that we know now that you know, we didn't know, uh, even at the time of the Arecibo message, is that virtually all of the stars that we see out there have planets around them. So there are a lot of places that life could exist, uh, and we are uh, attempting to make contact to let them know that we are here, which they maybe already know from the TV and radio signals we've been sending out. But not only that, but we're interested in making contact and we're willing to say hello. I think that's an important message as we uh, put our lives in context. It's uh, it's great to think about uh, how some of these activities can sort of uh, sort of reframe these questions. So actually, we we got a question online um, during the presentation. I'm just going to kind of head back to Earth here. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, but one one question we got was. Um, was how astronomers prioritize where to look for habitable planets uh, given that there are so many planets. And, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And and, and uh, the search goes on. Uh, I think this person was asking about the search for extraterrestrial life in general. And we can we can search for it. You know, there are really three 
three ways we have of finding life beyond Earth. One is to search for it uh, in our solar system. So uh, just before uh, those Voyager spacecraft were launched, the Viking spacecraft went to Mars to look for evidence of, of life there. So the, the beauty of that is, you know, it is in our own uh, galactic backyard. The downside is, you know, it takes billions to send a spacecraft. And so we, we look for planets that we could imagine uh, would promote the metabolic processes, that there'd be enough heat. Uh, you know, in, in the old days, it was, we would imagine that life could exist on the Earth or on Venus or on Mars, because those are in the habitable zone. Uh, far enough from our sun uh, to support liquid water. You know, uh, over the decades, we've realized Mar uh, Venus is actually has this greenhouse effect, so it's going to be pretty hot. Uh, but at least in the past, uh, Mars may have been habitable with flowing water. Uh, so even if they, they weren't there to look for the for Crows' signals. <laughs> there, that, that's right. Intelligent life, but there could be... Uh... There could be microbial life. But then the other alternative with, with the search for intelligent life is um, to start closest. So that was the strategy used by the early SETI astronomers looking at the thousand nearest stars. And the idea is, you know, possibly what they're doing is uh, maybe if we get a signal from a nearby star, they're responding to some of the TV and radio signals that have been accidentally leaking off into space. And it's easier to detect a weak signal close to Earth than one that's far. So that's been the strategy. And as we uh, develop projects to target and transmit to uh, stars, that's also our priority, nearby stars. And, you know, in, in the earliest days, we would focus on those planets that we knew to have exoplanets. So back in the 80s and 90s, that was popular. Now that we know that they're virtually everywhere, um, the strategy is just focus on the nearby ones because they may well have uh, habitable planets. Maybe one out of five uh, stars has not only planets around it, but an Earth-like one in its habitable zone. Yeah, that's true. The statistics have gotten much more encouraging. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> so I, I don't know if we have any other questions coming online. I think um, if we, uh, looks like, uh, one question was, oh, how... oh, right, right. So how, how do you, how do you know, uh, whether, w how it spins? C can you, can you bring that, uh, sure. up, right? Yeah, so let's bring up that, uh, let's bring up that cover. Um, because that's the, that's the big question. You know, my, my big fear is that sending a message is kind of like sending a cosmic Rorschach test. How do we know that we're really, even if it, even if it makes sense to us, how do we know that we're not just imposing our own meaning on it? And so uh, one of the ways to give the extraterrestrials a clue that they got it right uh, is to send a picture of the first image once they have encoded it. And so this is the first picture that you get. It's a simple circle. Again, it goes back to the idea of fun, of fun Littrow, of carve a circle in the Sahara Desert. And independently, this was uh, Philip Morrison, one of the early SETI pioneers, suggested a simple, elegant circle. So that's one of the ways, if they play it the wrong way, that's not the first thing they get. If they if they play it the opposite direction, that's what they'll get. It's a good thing it's at least a 50-50 chance. That's right, that's right. And uh, it was kind of interesting, actually, as we um, uh, as we were preparing for this presentation, um, we ran across this article in the New York Times that, uh, that kind of got, I think, very interestingly philosophical about our search for life elsewhere and kind of what it means to potentially find particularly intelligent life where where you sort of encouraged by maybe the idea that uh, as we think about all the problems that we're having on earth uh, that uh, that there are maybe civilizations that have gone through it already and survived. I, I think so. And, you know, that's one of the big questions. So we, we've been looking and we haven't found anything. I think it can seem like we've looked more than we have because the search has been going on 50 years. It hasn't been continuous. Um, but still, we haven't found any civilizations out there. So why not? Is it they never existed or they're somewhat like we worry about for ourselves uh, at our times of greatest doubt? Do they destroy themselves uh, in a nuclear war? And, and so it may be that uh, a young civilization like ours is... Um, very unusual. 
the one thing to think about is if we do make contact that civilization is probably going to be much uh, more stable much more long-lived than we are and i say that because the radio signals that we use to communicate we've had for just a hundred years that's how long we've had radio well if that's the norm in the galaxy civilization has radio for a hundred years then they destroy themselves then it's virtually impossible that we'll make contact and, and maybe that's why we haven't gotten a signal if we do get a signal um it probably means they've been at this much longer, you know, because otherwise, given that our galaxy is 13 billion years old, a hundred years out of that time is, is it's like a, a firefly flicking yeah. off once in the course of a night. What's the chance that two are going to do it exactly the same time? It's not going to happen. So if we do get a signal, it's going to be from a long lived civilization. And I think we often wonder, well, what, what do we tell them about? Maybe they'll understand um, math and science. But is that our most unique contribution? I think not. I think, in fact, it is the very struggles that we have. Uh, it is our own uh, uncertainty about whether we're going to get through uh, these difficult times and be around hundreds or thousands of years to get a reply. I think that may be one of the most distinctive things we have to offer, that it may not be that we're the most stable civilization in the galaxy. But, you know, when I look around at the kind of events that we have seen in the last couple of weeks, um, we are a planet whose whose um, whose joys and triumphs are balanced uh, by our failures uh, and and uh, sometimes our sense of hopelessness. And I think it is to be able to convey that balance and to reflect on it ourselves. You know, that maybe that's the most important part of the search. We hope that we'll make contact with the extraterrestrials, but if in the process we can gain a better perspective on ourselves, I think that's perhaps the most important part. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for joining us this morning, Doug. I really appreciate your time. Um, we may get some more questions and comments. If so, we'll ask the answer those in the comments. But uh, great, great. again, thanks for your time and uh, uh, stay safe out there. And okay, thanks. Thanks. Okay, take care. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.